Thank you very much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Now, Erica told me that when I speak, don't say anything offensive, divisive, or profane. So that concludes my remarks today. Let me give you the Cliff Notes version of how I got into talk radio before we get into our discussion. Uh, I was living and working in Cleveland, even though I'm from LA, and um, every now and then I would write an op-ed piece, and from time to time they'd get published in the Cl Cleveland Plain Dealer. So I wrote one, this is about 30 years ago, where I talked about uh, racism in America, and I said that racism, of course, exists in America, will always exist in America. You've got a country of 300 million people, you're going to find some idiots. But for the most part, racism is no longer a major obstacle to success. That was, that was 30 years ago. So 30 years ago, it's how I still feel. 30 years ago, I guess that was revolutionary. I got a phone call from a producer of a radio show. You really believe that racism is no longer a major problem in America? I said, yes. He said, would you mind coming on my guy's show tonight? Uh, he would like to talk to you about that. I'd never been on radio before. So I said, okay, and I was on for an hour. And during that hour, I was called an Uncle Tom, a bootlicking Uncle Tom, foot shuffling bootlicking Uncle Tom, <laughs> bug eyed foot shuffling bootlicking Uncle Tom, the Antichrist, and I was called the word that you use on a black person when you really want to cut to the quick. I was called Republican. <laughs> a man can only take so much. So I drive back to my office, phone rings, it's the station a programming director. He said, I heard you today. You were amazing. I was? Oh my goodness. You were funny. You have a good speaking voice. You took difficult positions. You defended them without losing your sense of humor or your temper. Have you ever thought about doing talk radio? I said, no. He said, I've got a guy going on, going on vacation next week. I was going to get a pro to sit in for him, but I'd love for you to do it. Will you do it? I said, no. <laughs> he said, why? I said, I don't like being yelled at. And I don't like yelling at other people. He said, are you married? At the time I was, he says, do me a favor, go home to your wife and talk it over and call me tomorrow. I said, I'll do that, but I doubt that I'll change my mind. I went home to my then wife, Cindy, and I told her about this. She said, well, what do you think about talk radio? I said, I know very little about it other than it seems shallow, glib, and stupid. <laughs> she said, it is. You'd be good at it. <laughs> Gives you an idea what happened to that marriage. So, so I, I started it, and um, I ended up meeting Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager introduced me to management at KBC, but for Dennis Prager, I wouldn't be on the radio. So every time I speak, I like to make sure that Dennis gets credit for it. The, uh, the headwind that uh, Trump is facing is the same headwind that any Republican faces, and that's what I call the access of indoctrination. We're talking about Hollywood, academia, and media. All three are vehemently against Republican ideas, against the concept of liberty, and it's a fight that we all have to, have to battle, and Trump uh, has to battle it as well. Hollywood, about 90% of the contributions Hollywood makes to, to politicians and to political causes go to left-wing politicians and left-wing political causes. Uh, you name the left-wing cause and Hollywood is right there. Uh, I defy you to find an A-list young star who is a Republican out of the closet. Name one. We can name a whole bunch of them that are um, uh, lefties, but name one that's, uh, that's an A-list. I'm talking about somebody young, not somebody like Kelsey Grammer who's made his money and then came out. I'm talking about somebody young. Name somebody. Um, I, um, <laughs> Kanye West. <laughs> the, um, the intense pressure to conform in Hollywood is unreal. I once had a TV show called uh, Moral Court. It was on a number of years ago. And the guy that designed my set, beautiful set, cost a million dollars to design the set, told me that after he designed the set, uh, he was asked to design a set for the Republican Party. And he did. He's not even a Republican. He's just a good set designer. He told me after he designed the set for the Republicans, he could not get work because people shunned him. How dare you even design the set? He said, I'm not even a Republican. You should have turned down the offer. Uh, the other day, uh, my girlfriend, who used to be an actress for a number of years, uh, someone came over uh, who knew her. Uh, they were visiting from Michigan. The, the mother brought the daughter. The daughter might be 14 years old, the most gorgeous 14-year-old girl I've ever seen in my life. She was doing some modeling in Michigan. Somebody urged her to come out to L.A. And so came out with, the, with her mother, left, left the father back home for a few months to see whether or not she would be able to make it. She ended up getting a meeting with CAA. That's one of the major agencies uh, in, uh, in Hollywood. And I'm just listening to the conversation, watching TV, and I heard the woman say something about Trump. 
and it was something positive about Trump. This is before the, before the election. And I said, excuse me, are you a Trump supporter? She said, yes. I said, you have a meeting tomorrow at CAA? She said, yes. I said, do not bring this up. She thought I was joking. I said, I am not joking. She comes over the next day and she said, Larry, had you not told us that, there's no question that we would not have been, been retained because they spent the first 20 minutes trashing Trump. And we almost said something early, I would almost said something early on in, indicating that I was in favor of Trump, but I remember what she said, I didn't say anything. Uh, I'm telling you, that, that uh, young lady would not have been hired. I'll give you another quick example. Uh, a scout lo locator came to my house one day and said, we want to use your, your, your property, your lawn over here for catering because we're shooting a movie next door. Uh, Annette uh, Benning and Antonio Banderas shot some movie. And I said, sure, we negotiated a little price. And the day they were shooting, I wanted to see. I'd never seen a movie shot before, so I'm watching them. And the caterer comes up to me and we start talking. Now, no one could hear what we were saying because we were far away. Six months later, I get a phone call from the caterer on the radio. He says, you remember me? I was at your house. I said, yeah, we had a long conversation. He said, I haven't worked since then. Nobody could hear what we, what we were saying, but it was obvious I was friendly to you, and that was it. I've never worked since then. Academia. You look at a typical poli-sci department or women's studies department or history department, and you will not find a single registered Republican. Uh, department of 30 or 40 at UCLA, I think they found one or two that were registered Republican. Overwhelmingly, the professors are registered uh, as Democrats or a party of the left even worse than, uh, than Democrats. And you name the cockamamie idea, whether it's um, race-based preferences, whether it's reparations, uh, whether it's the, the issue of abortion, the professors are way, way, way left uh, of this country. Uh, and these are the people who are teaching our kids. And the ones coming under the professors, the assistant professors and associate professors, are even more left-wing. And then, of course, we have the media. Uh, watch CNN, watch MSNBC. Uh, and they had President Trump uh, impeached before he even took office. It's, it's really astounding. Um, and uh, the other day, Chuck Todd, the host of MSNBC, Meet the Press, teed off on Trump uh, for going off on the media, uh, talking about uh, how it's unfair to attack the media. All we're trying to do is our job. Um, whenever anybody from MSNBC or CNN, or NBC rather, says anything at all, anything at all, I always give them a two-word response, Al Sharpton. The man has a show on MSNBC. This is the man who once called the mayor of New York an N-word whore, who once called Jews diamond merchants, called whites moving into Harlem interlopers. Um, he was in the streets of Ferguson before one word had been taken from testimony for the grand jury that found out that Michael Brown did not have his hands up, did not say don't shoot, but there was Sharpton uh, in the streets of Ferguson yelling, no justice, no peace. This man has a TV show, and we're getting a lecture from someone on MSNBC. It, it's a joke. It's an absolute farce. Uh, the New York Times has not endorsed a Republican for president since 1956. The Washington Post has not endorsed one in its history. They've only been endorsing presidents for 50 years, but in 50 years, they haven't found a Republican decent enough to support, including Ronald Reagan. This is what we are up against. A Pew Research poll uh, a few years ago found that only 7% of reporters self-described uh, as Republicans. 93% call themselves something other than Republicans. And these are the people gathering our news, disseminating our, disseminating our news. These are the people that we read. Uh, I have a friend named Tim Grossclose who wrote a book called Left Turn. He looked at the top 20 sources of news in the country, NBC, ABC, CBS, LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, MSNBC, all, the, all of them. Only two of them were center right. There was the Washington Times and the nightly news on Fox with Brett Baer. Outside of that, everything else was left wing. He said, uh, he, it's the first book that I've ever read that tried to quantify what I call the effect or the damage of the left wing media. And he says, if the media were truly fair and balanced, truly fair and balanced, the average state would vote the way Texas does, which is about eight to 10 points in favor of a Republican. That is the impact the left-wing media has on this country. Uh, and Trump is absolutely right about the effect of uh, the manipulation of Google and, uh, uh, and Twitter uh, and Facebook. There's a wonderful documentary called The Wavy Line, The Creepy Line, by Peter Schweitzer. I urge you to see it when it comes out. And he talks all about uh, the manipulation of data uh, by these major search engines and by these social media outlets. Uh, and uh, all of them are left-wing, and it's another battle that we all have to fight. When I first saw Donald Trump make his announcement for presidency, you might remember he talked about Mexicans and they're, they're not sending their best or whatever it was he said. 
And I said to myself, watching it on TV, this is gonna be the shortest presidential campaign you've ever seen. <laughs> the next morning, I'm in a restaurant in an area of LA called Sunland. Anybody know that area? It's a blue collar area. And if there is an area of California that's sort of representative of middle America, it's probably that area. So I'm sitting there, I was there for business, having a nice greasy breakfast, the kind I like, <laughs> sitting at the bar. Someone comes up to me and says, did you, are you Larry Elder? Yeah. Did you see Trump last night? I said, yeah. He said, what did you think? I said, what did you think? He said, he speaks for me. And he walked away. I said, that was interesting. So I dived into my hash browns. And another guy comes up to me and, and are you Larry Elder? Did you see, yeah, I saw, what did you think? What did you think? He said, my wife and I were just cheering, walked away. I'm there for an hour. At least 15 people came up to me and said something similar. So I went on the air and I said, I have never seen a man connect like that with regular people. This man is gonna get the nomination. He's gonna become the next president of the United States. That's exactly what happened. I campaigned for him and I campaigned with him. We were at a black church in Cleveland. Uh, and for him to stand up and captivate that audience the way he did and talked about the importance of family and talked about the importance of the economy and talked about the importance of, uh, of working hard and, and accountability, it was, it was absolutely riveting. It really was. Um, I felt that and said to him, there's one thing that you've said, Mr. Trump, one thing that you said that I think that you should apologize for. Not the other stuff about, about John McCain, not the stuff about the rapist, not the stuff about anything else. I said, you said that George W. Bush lied us into the war in Iraq. A majority of Democrats believe that George W. Bush lied us into the Iraq war. There was a commission called the Rob Silver Commission, I told Trump, uh, that concluded nobody lied. The intelligence was wrong, the stockpiles were not there that they thought were gonna be there, but no body lied. And I said, that's the one thing that I feel that you should, that you should have apologized for. He went, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I've discovered that Trump's way of apologizing is not to say the same wrong-headed thing twice. So <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, that, that's good enough. The, uh, the tax cuts have been fantastic, obviously. Uh, we're talking about 4. 2% now, it got uh, goosed up one, uh, one tenth of a point. So it's 4.2% for the current last quarter. Uh, and the Atlanta Fed estimates that this next quarter could be even higher. If there are back-to-back 4% -back GDP quarter growth, and we're going into November in the midterm, all bets are off. All bets are off. Uh, I think it's a coin flip. I hope that uh, the Democrats fail, of course, in taking control of the House, because if they do, they will immediately begin impeachment proceedings. If they do, I don't believe the president will be impeached. I believe there'll be 20 or 30 reasonable Democrats who recognize that next time the shoe is gonna be on the other foot. And if you don't like somebody for political reasons or stylistic reasons and you impeach them, your guy or gal is next. I think 20 or 30 of them will recognize that and won't do it. But if I am wrong, it goes to the Senate and there has never been a senator who's voted to expel a president of his own party. It's never happened. It didn't happen in the Andrew Johnson impeachment uh, and then trial. It did not happen in the Clinton impeachment and trial. It won't happen in the Trump impeachment and trial. This is a man who has over 90% support from Republicans. That is the highest I have ever seen in my lifetime over a sustained period of time. President George Herbert Walker Bush, after the successful Persian Gulf War, briefly had popularity around that level, but it leveled off. Trump has stayed there, hasn't gone anywhere. Doesn't matter about the op-ed piece that was published. Doesn't matter about the Michael book uh, that was published. Doesn't matter about Omarosa's book. Doesn't matter about Bob Woodward's book. I find it interesting, too, that Bob Woodward's book is the one that's perceived to be the most credible. I'm watching CNN and MSNB hee haw, that's what I call it. <laughs> And, um, well, it's one thing for Omarosa to write a book, it's another thing for Michael Wolf to write a book, it's another thing for there to be an unsigned op-ed piece, but, but my goodness, Bob Woodward, he's got credibility, he's got journalistic chops, he's, uh, he was Woodward Bernstein team. Yeah, he's the same guy who wrote a book called George W. Bush at War, in which he argued that the intelligence was absolutely clear that all 16 of our intelligence agencies said at the highest level of probability, there's no such thing as 100%, at the highest level of probability that Saddam Hussein had stockpiled a WMD. In his book, he also said that, uh, that uh, the same CIA director, uh, George Tenet, who served under Bill Clinton, was also there and gave the same intelligence that it was a slam dunk. This is what Woodward 
wrote in his book, and yet a majority of Democrats to this day believe George W. Bush lied us into the war. So where was all the credibility of Bob Woodward then? Bob Woodward made something that you guys don't believe. Now fast forward, he's trashing Trump and he's St. Robert. How, how, how did that happen? How did that happen? Where was he? Where were you then? Do you know there's a poll that just came out? 55% of Democrats believe, not that Russia just meddled, that vote tallies were changed in order for Trump to win the election. There is zero evidence of that. Jay Johnson, Obama's Secretary of Homeland Security, said several times that there's no evidence whatsoever that the Russians change vote tallies, yet a majority of Democrats believe that. This is what we're up against. And they're mad because Donald Trump dared to suggest that uh, perhaps Barack Obama might not be born here and, and spent some money researching that. That's, that's outlandish, but it's perfectly okay for you to believe that George W. Bush lied us into the war, even though the evidence says otherwise. And it's perfectly okay for you to believe that the, the Russians changed the outcome of the election by changing vote tallies, even though nobody in the intelligence community says so. So Trump's a bad guy for rejecting the intelligence community's conclusions, but you're a good guy for even though you are rejecting the intelligence community's conclusions about the war, and about the intel, and about the Russian meddling in the, in the election. Outrageous, absolutely outrageous, and still the president is surviving. He's got a popularity that's a little bit higher than Barack Obama's at this time, despite the avalanche of negative publicity by the media. I think Pew Research said that <laughs> said that uh, I think January, February, March, 91% of the news was negative. 91% was negative. In, no in October 1992, George Herbert Walker Bush runs for re-election against Bill Clinton. According to a study done by Investors Business Daily, 90% of the newspapers that talked about economic news, 90% of the stories were negative. Even though we were in the 16th consecutive month of economic growth, 90% of the stories were negative. The next month, November, Bill Clinton wins. They looked at the same newspapers, all of a sudden just 14% of the newspapers had negative stories. Pourquoi? All of a sudden their guy got in, the very same numbers, they were interpreting them differently. This is the kind of nonsense that the Republicans always have to deal with. And still, and still, we win. I'd like to tell you real quickly one of the reasons I'm so optimistic in general about the country. Uh, it's because of my mom and my dad. I had wonderful, wonderful parents, although it was a while before I realized how wonderful my dad was. <laughs> Uh, my dad uh, was a World War II vet. He was a Monfort Point Marine. They were the first black Marines. And uh, I couldn't stand the SOB. Neither my, my, my two brothers either. So I didn't think it was me. I thought it was him. He seemed mean. He seemed honorary almost all the time, ill-tempered. Sometimes I even wondered why he had kids. And I told myself, when I get big enough and strong enough, I was going to kick his butt. <laughs> so I'm now... Uh, 12 years old or so, my dad saved his nickels and dimes. Uh, he cleaned toilets for a living and started a small cafe. So all of us had to work for him. I did not like working for him either. He yelled at me and he would yell at us sometimes. And, and um, I would like to tell you when I was 15 years old, I said to myself, the next time this SOB yells at me, I'm going to say, now see here, mano a mano, let's sit down, let's talk. But I was afraid of my father. So I told myself the next time he yells at me, I'm just going to leave, which was a monstrous act of defiance. My dad yelled at me, I was 15, went in the back, took off the apron, and I left. The waitress had called in sick that day, so my dad was there by himself. We're talking about a little diner, but it was full, maybe 15 people. He was steamed. He got home and he said, why did you leave? And I said, I got tired of the way you spoke to me. My dad paid me $10 a day plus tips. He bowled up the $10, he threw it at me as I lay on the bed. He walked out of my bedroom, and I promise you, we did not have a conversation for 10 years. I mean nothing. It's easy to avoid him until I graduated from high school. I went to, went to college in the East Coast, law school in the Midwest. I would visit uh, my, my parents, my mom, and I would just make sure my dad wasn't physically around. So literally, we did not have a conversation for 10 years. Now I'm 25 years old. Graduated from law school, living large. I got a, a major job at a major law firm. I was making the equivalent of about $150,000, 25 years old. I should be living large. I can't sleep. And I know it has something to do with unresolved issues with my dad. So I called my secretary and I said, cancel all my appointments. I'm flying to LA and I'll be back in a couple of days. I didn't tell my parents I was coming because I didn't want my dad to prepare for this summit. I figured it'd last five or 10 minutes. So I walk into the cafe at 1.30. My dad was shocked, of course, to see me. He had two big bags. I said, dad, I want to talk to you. He said, okay, wait until we close. Shall I put your bags in the back? I said, no, dad, I'm only going to be here for about five or 10 minutes. I want to tell you something. 
So I figured it'd be five minutes of me telling him off. He'd call me an ungrateful SOB. At least maybe I could sleep. I said, so for the hour, I was waiting. I said, Larry, don't tee off on the guy. Just tell him a few things that bothered you and get out the door. So my dad sat down, and of course, I teed off on him. I spoke for 20 minutes nonstop. You guys know how I can go. And I talked about every whipping, every slight, everything he ever said to me, everything he ever did to me that bothered me, everything, everything, everything. And then I was out of ammo. And my dad looks up and he goes, is that it? <laughs> you didn't speak to me for 10 years because of that? And I said, yeah. And it's the first time I saw my father cry, I did not think the man had the ability to, to produce tears. He said, let me tell you about my father. I'm hearing this for the first time at 25 years old. He says, my last name, Elder, that's not the name of my biological father. I didn't know that. I said, who is your biological father? He says, I have no idea. He said his mother was illiterate. Um, she was irresponsible, had a series of boyfriends, each one more irresponsible than the other one. The reason he took the name Elder is that Elder was the boyfriend who was in his life the longest. An alcoholic who physically uh, beat him up, who beat up his mother, um, and stayed in his life four or five years. And she had another series of boyfriends after that. My dad said he came home at the age of 13, Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow South, and started quarreling with his mom's then boyfriend. She sided with the boyfriend, threw my father out of the house, never to return. You're talking about a black boy, 13 years old, as I mentioned, Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow South, right at the beginning of the Great Depression. I defy you to find a hand dealt that bad. I said, what did you do? He said, I, I walked down this, the, the road and I took whatever I could take and eventually I started cooking. I got a job as a Pullman porter. That's how he ended up in California. He was on the trains and came out here on a route one time. It was sunny. People seemed less racist. My dad made a mental note that maybe someday I'll relocate to California. Pearl Harbor. My dad joined the Marines. I said, why? He said, they go where the action is. I love the uniforms. <laughs> Stationed in Guam. When the war was over, my dad goes back to Chattanooga where he had met and married my mom, and my dad was a staff sergeant in charge of cooking facilities. My dad could look at a cake and tell you what's in it, look at a pie and tell you what's in it. He could make anything. And he tried to get him a job as a short order cook. He goes to restaurant, to restaurant, to restaurant in Chattanooga, and he's told, we don't hire niggers. He goes to an unemployment office. The lady says, you went through the wrong door. My dad goes to the hall, sees colored only, goes through the door to the very same lady that sent him out. My dad came home to my mom and said, this is BS. I'm going to LA and get me a job as a cook. He goes out to L.A., he walks around for a, a day and a half, goes to restaurant, to restaurant, to restaurant, and they said, I'm sorry, you have no references. My dad said, I cook for the military. I have no references. And he offered to work for free for two weeks, just write me a reference. They wouldn't even do that. He was treated the same way in L.A. as he was in Chattanooga. They were a little more genteel about it. My dad went to an unemployment office, this time just one door, and the lady says, I have nothing. And he said, what time do you open? She said, eight, what time do you close? 5.30. My dad said, I'll be here until you have something. She calls him up after a day and a half. She says, I have something, don't think you're gonna want it. My dad says, I'm sure I'm gonna want it, what is it? She says, the job in Nabisco brand bread cleaning toilets. My dad took that job for 10 years, took a second job at another bread company for 10 years cleaning toilets, went to night school two or three nights a week to get his GED, and cooked for a family on the weekends. The man never slept, which was why he was always cranky. This man averaged three and a half, four hours of sleep, not day after day, or week after week, or month after month. We're talking year after year. Imagine coming home with three rambunctious boys with no sleep. I get it. And so as my dad was speaking, I got smaller and smaller and smaller, and my dad got bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, I said to him, Dad, I am so sorry. Now both of us are crying. And he said, don't be, Larry. Just follow the advice I've always given you and your brothers. Hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. Larry, you cannot control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you bitch, moan, and whine about what somebody did to you or said to you, go to the nearest mirror and say, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, no matter how good you are, how hard you work, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen. How you respond to those bad things will tell your mom and me if we raised a man. I wrote a book about this eight-hour conversation. It's called uh, Dear Father, Dear Son, Two Lies, Eight Hours. The reason for the title is when I went back to Cleveland, my dad wrote me a letter. He had never written me a letter before. And it said, Dear Son. So I replied, and I never called my dad father, and I wrote back, Dear Father. 
Uh, and um, it was the, one of my most prized possessions. I'm getting cracking up now, I'm telling you. But um, thank you for that. Um, I'm supposed to speak for about the half hour I already have. I want to tell you just a few quick stories and then I'll, I'll take some Q&A. I haven't mentioned my mom. My mom grew up on a farm in Huntsville, Alabama. So as far as, as my dad was concerned, my mom was almost royalty. She had her, her family owned the farm. During the Great Depression, my mom said nobody suffered. In fact, we sold ex excerpt, uh, ex excess uh, food to other people. Um, and uh, so as far as my dad was concerned, she was like, almost like royalty. My mother had one year of college. And for a black woman in the South to go away for one year and you come back, as far as the South is concerned, you're, you're, you're educated. My mother always told me to pay attention to my a academics, that the way up and out is to, is to do well in school. So it was no question I was going to go to college, just a question of which one it was. My mother sat me down on the book of all the presidents when I was a kid, from the first one, Washington, to the then incumbent, Dwight Eisenhower, went through every single president. And when we were done with it, she closed the book and she turned to me, and I was seven years old. She said, Larry, someday, if you want it, you can be in this book. And there was no question in my mind that if that was my goal, it never was, that I could do it. My mother always, always, always made us feel that way. I mention that because when Obama got elected, uh, I'm old school. I still got the LA Times, New York Times thrown to my house. And there were pictures on both paper, uh, papers, front page pictures, with black parents holding their kids. And they were all saying this, I can now tell my kid, you can grow up to be anything and mean it. I've been telling kids this. She said, I've been telling my kid this, but I always had my fingers crossed. I really didn't mean it. And I, and I said, went on the air and I said, what would they have said had Obama lost? I mean, my goodness. You only now believe that if you work hard in America, you can make it if you're black with all the success we've had? You know, the greatest period of economic success for black people was 1940 to 1960. No affirmative action, no set-asides, just working hard. Um, when the hostages were taken uh, in 1979, I think it was, in Iran, I was practicing law. I was just you know, a second-year lawyer, and I was in a room with a bunch of other second-year lawyers. We were all talking about what we ought to do. How do we get the hostages back? What should we do? What should we do? I said, no, what my mom would do. They said, what? I said, she'd give them 48 hours and bomb the hell out of them. <laughs> and they said, nobody's mother thinks like that. I said, you don't know mine. I said, watch this. We're all in the room now, no speakerphone. I pick up the phone, I call my mom uh, in LA. I said, mom, the hostages, and they couldn't hear the other end, and so they're hearing my end. And I said, mom, what would you do about the hostages? Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, okay, thanks. They said, well, did you say she'd give them 48 hours? I said, no. They said, I told you. I said, no, she's mellowing. She said she'd give them 72. When I was in high school, we read a poem by County Cullen, and it goes like this. While riding through a Baltimore so small and full of glee, I saw a young Baltimorean keep a looking straight at me. Now, I was young and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled. But he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until September. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. Well, I was upset. The class was upset. The teacher was upset. They were all talking about the permanent stain to this kid's psyche. He'll always think of himself as a second-class citizen. I went home to my mother. She's in the kitchen uh, stirring a big pot of greens. I'll never forget it. I said, Mom, we read a poem in class. I want to get your reaction to it. I knew her reaction was going to be different from the teacher's, although I wasn't sure what it would be. And I said, um, it's by County Cullen. And she said, yeah, what is it? I said, it goes like this. While riding through old Baltimore, so small and full of glee, I saw a young Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now, I was young and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled. But he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until September. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. My mom took the spoon out of the pot, hit it on the side, and she said, what a darn shame he let something so trivial spoil his vacation. How many wings do you want? <laughs> Last story. I'm often remembered, reminded of how great this country is and how, how lucky I am. The other day I'm at a gas station and I pull up in my late model car that was given to me by one of my clients, wearing a nice tailored suit made by one of my clients. I take out my credit card with a substantial credit limit on it and I'm getting premium gas. Next to the bay up comes a 1968 Dodge Polaro with a busted muffler. Out of state license plate from the south Man comes out, and another man comes out. I can tell they're father and son because of the resemblance. 
Maybe they have three teeth together collectively. <laughs> they get five dollars of regular and they motor off. And I'm watching them leave and I said to myself, wow, just think, those two dudes owe me reparations. Is this a great country or what? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. May God bless you. May God bless America. I wanted to get going um, um, on the political side. The question is, even if Trump avoids impeachment, how can he advance his legislative agenda with the House under Pelosi's leadership? Uh, it's going to be difficult. I think if the uh, Democrats take over the House, uh, his agenda is going to be stalled. Um, I, it'll be harder to, to build the wall, harder to get more tax cuts. Um, but what he's done so far, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, cutting all these regulations, if he does nothing else but maintain the course, uh, I'm good with that. Um, again, I'm not at all convinced that the Democrats are going to take the House. Uh, again, if you get back-to-back -back quarters of get back-to-back -back quarters of 4% plus GDP growth, uh, we have a whole different conversation. And I really do believe that um, the Democrats have no message. What is their message? $15 minimum wage, free health care, free tuition, uh, raising taxes. Uh, climate change. What's, what is their agenda? What is their agenda? And isn't it fascinating? Obama wants to take credit for an economy that the Democrats say is bad. Uh, good point. Okay, that's, a, that's good. Actually, before you, um, we have heard a lot of talk about the leadership. Will it be Pelosi? That's been tried before. She's been laying low. What do you, do you like to discuss that? I think if the Democrats take control of the House, Pelosi could become Speaker again. She seems to have the money. She seems to have all the people lined up. And don't forget, she is a money-raising powerhouse. And you get on the wrong side of Nancy Pelosi and you're a Democrat and you're, you're in a tough race and you want money. So as far as I'm concerned, if Pelosi becomes, if the Democrats take over the House, Pelosi becomes the Speaker. Uh, and I believe that the Republicans will be using that as an uh, argument to uh, vote against Democrats because do you want Pelosi back again? Okay. Something that was very hot over the last few days, the op-ed anonymous author. Treason, what do you think? Any comments? Who was it? All right, I have a strange theory. Now stay with me here. The op-ed was designed supposedly to uh, let the base know that there's chaos in the White House. Let them know that this guy is out of control. Let them know that uh, this guy is mercurial. It didn't make a dent in, in uh, Trump's popularity as far as Republicans are concerned. And all it did was reinforce the notion that there is a deep state. There is somebody inside the administration trying to undermine the agenda. If anything, it added more fuel to Trump's argument about an, an infiltration, about people trying to bring me down. So it's my theory that it was written by Trump. I have no proof. That is original. Yeah. That's, 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 uh, I have no proof, but uh, yeah. that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Oh, boy. Well, if that happens, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. That's, right. that's where I, so. I mean, he sets the agenda. People are upset about his tweets. I'm not. First thing they do is check what he's tweeted, which means he sets the agenda. It, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. The, the, uh, the media has pushed uh, the notion that uh, sexism remains a major problem in America. They push the notion that racism remains a major problem in America. Uh, and this is a kind of nonsense we have to put up with. Just the other day, Obama came out uh, and said that uh, he's going to push for women to earn the same uh, amount of money that men earn for doing the same work. They already do. They do. That's yeah, crazy. It is such a lie. And if it weren't true, and it's a real easy way to prove it's a lie, if it is true that women are willing to work for less money and be as productive as men, and you're running a company, why would you hire any men at all? Fire, fire the SOBs, pocket the difference. And then, and then racism. Colin Kaepernick, as you know, isn't he from around, this, from around these parts? I understand he was the original speaker, but you guys couldn't afford him. He was too busy taking a knee. Um, this whole thing had started because of Ferguson. Obama even mentioned Ferguson at a speech in the United Nations. 
We have our own ethnic problems. There's a place called Ferguson, yada, blah, et cetera. Except that Michael Brown didn't have his hands up, except he didn't say don't shoot, except they found his DNA on the, on the firing arm, uh, and the grand jury said that the officer acted completely lawfully. Outside of that, he nailed it. <laughs> it is a lie that there is institutional racism against, against black people. It's a lie. Are there bad cops? Of course there are bad cops. But honestly, the study, the, the evidence is just not there. There is a economist with uh, Harvard named Roland Fryer, he happens to be black. He is the youngest tenured professor ever at Harvard, I understand. That's how brilliant the guy is. He said he heard about all these shootings and he just knew that the police were using more deadly force against blacks and against whites. So he decided to do a research paper. Found out it was the opposite. The police are more hesitant, more reluctant to use deadly force against a black person. That replicates another study that was done by a couple of professors uh, in Washington state. Look at the research done by Heather McDonald. It just is false. Even the Washington Post once looked at a recent year, found out the cops killed 1,000 people, uh, 250 of them were black, 500 of them were white. 17 unarmed black men were killed. Unarmed does not mean not dangerous. Michael Brown was unarmed. Doesn't mean you're not dangerous. Um, 17, there were about 22 whites unarmed who were killed. I was invited to give a speech by Urban Meyer before uh, his team. Uh, he hears my show in Columbus and he said he has speakers coming in once a month and he had a speaker last month who was talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, got everybody all ticked off. Would you come in and, and give me your point of view? I can't give you my point of view, he said, but I want you to give a different perspective. We can't pay you, you have to do it on your own dime. So I flew in on my own dime, spoke to these kids, 100 of them. And I said, gave the stats that the Washington Post gave and I said 17 unarmed black men were killed, uh, 22 unarmed white men were killed, name one. So you see the point? And I said, there were 300 people injured by lightning last year. Now lightning does not injure proportionally by race, but there are 7% black men in the country, so if lightning did, that would mean 21 black men were injured by, by lightning. You are more likely as a black man to be injured by lightning than as an unarmed black man to be shot by a cop. That is how rare this is. Meanwhile, 6,000 blacks were killed mostly by other blacks last, last year. Uh, just recently in Chicago, 71 shot, 13 killed on one weekend. By the way, nobody arrested. They've got a clearance rate of about 15% in Chicago because nobody is telling the police anything. And you want to talk about the rare instance in which somebody is killed by a cop, not that we should ignore it, but for crying out loud, it's investigated. And the way to deal with this is for more and more cops to carry dash cams and body cams. Here in California, there's a city called Rialto, uh, and it's about 68,000. And the cops were mandated for one year to have body cams. And many of the cops didn't want to wear them. But they were forced to. After a year, what happened? Police complaints fell 90%. Police use of force fell 50%. What happened? It wasn't the police changing their behavior. They behaved as they were trained to behave. What happened is the civilians stopped lying and stop challenging them, and the cops therefore didn't have to use the kind of force they had to use before the cameras. It turns out the cameras changed the civilian's behavior, not the cop's behavior. So when they're wearing cameras, the, the likelihood is it's gonna vindicate the officers uh, and not the suspects. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a bunch of really good ones. I uh, hope we can get going to them. This is a question you must Is that get your way off. of telling me not to take so long to answer? Okay. Yeah, it kinda was. <laughs> Very perceptive. The, right. um, this is a question you must I'm in, get. I'm in radio. We speak. We yeah, roll. Yeah, that's it. You got it. When I first got into radio, I said to myself, how am I going to speak for three hours? <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> this is a question you must get a lot. Um, where are the black Republicans? More people like you. <laughs> They're in this room. <laughs> the movement starts here. No, um, look, it's changing. You've got young people, uh, Kanye West was mentioned earlier. Uh, I've had Candace Owens on my show. <laughs> and according to the Pew Research poll, which is usually an outlier, about 35% of blacks now support President Trump. Now that's an outlier, but take the NAACP poll. 21%. That's still four times the amount of support Fantastic. President Trump had when he got elected in the black community. It is changing, I'll tell you why. Two big things. In Cleveland, when we were together, he talked about vouchers. Now, the average urban public school, kids cannot read, write, and compute at grade level. At the school that I graduated from called Crenshaw High School, if you saw the movie Boys in the Hood, that's my high school. 
3% of kids right now can do math at grade level, 3%. And that's up from 2% the year before. Now, what responsible parent would send his or her child to a school like that, which also, by the way, is run by the Crips, the gang? The reason I know that is because Ice-T went to my high school 10 years later and told me he went there because it was run by the Crips. What responsible parent is going to send their kid to that school if he or she has an option out? The Democrats are adamant opposing private school choice. The Republicans want private school choice. Now, if the route to the middle class is education, and the Republicans are telling you, you have an option to go to the best school you can possibly get into, and Democrats are saying, you're going here whether you like it or not, who gets their vote? Who gets your vote? The other reason is because of illegal immigration. If you look at polls, blacks are far more adamant against illegal immigration than whites are. Because Urban blacks and urban browns are the ones most likely to have their jobs taken away or have competition or downward pressure on their wages because of the unskilled, illegal uh, uh, workers they compete against. There's a uh, professor uh, at Harvard named George Borjas. He's probably done more research on the impact of legal and illegal immigration than maybe any other person in the country. He says there's no question that illegal aliens take jobs away from unskilled black and brown people in living in the inner city and puts downward pressure on their wages. Who is it who's trying to stop illegal immigration and who is it that doesn't give a rip? So for those two reasons alone, uh, Black people are taking another look at President, uh, President Trump, and another look at the Republican Party. So I think things are changing. Well, good to hear. Good. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to jump back to California, and then there will be more on the federal level as well. This is something I did hear uh, just the other day. I, it sounded too good to be true, so I don't want to get my hopes up. But there was a poll that says John Cox is five points behind Gavin Newsom. Right. Do you have a comment I saw on that, that poll, that? yeah. I saw that poll, and it, uh, it was, it's a legitimate poll. Uh, it's from a, a reputable uh, agency. Uh, I, was, I was heartened by that. Uh, their strategy may backfire. They wanted to run against Cox. Mm -hmm. They did not want to run against Villaraigosa. They figured that Villaraigosa would be a formidable candidate uh, against Gavin Newsom. Uh, that strategy may well backfire. I've had uh, Cox on the show a number of times. Uh, he's a dynamic speaker. Uh, and uh, who knows? Yeah, who yeah. knows? That if a Republican governor gets elected in California, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and the Democrats don't con take control of the House, there'll be mass suicide. That will. <laughs> oh. yeah. I know. Or as some happen. people call it, thinning the herd. <laughs> And along those lines, back to federal, what, do you, what effect do you think will have on the midterms by President Obama? Well, effect will there be? Well, he is the midterm. I mean, it, it's, he's the referendum. Uh, the Democrats are, are going to run against President Trump. Uh, he's on the ballot uh, in, in ways that you rarely see in an off-year election. Uh, and um, it still feels to me that when he comes to town and supports somebody, uh, that person's numbers go up. Uh, the people that Trump, for the most part, has supported, they've won their primaries. So he is still the man. He's the leader of the party. Uh, he still sells out. O Obama just came out here, gave a talk. 750 people showed up. Mm -hmm. Trump gets that without even, without even breaking a sweat. Yeah. And um, so again, I don't know. It's a coin toss. It certainly is not going to be a slam dunk blue wave the way they think. Yeah. Well, I thought was interesting is that I, I think Barack Obama had did a great job of getting himself reelected. But my recollection is when he, he lobbied for people, they didn't end up so well. No, it didn't. Election, he campaigned so. in the midterms twice, and uh, most of his people lost. Uh, he lost state houses. He lost races. Um, and again, his economy, this is the only president to preside over a recovery, Obama, without at least one year being 3%. He had a 2% recovery. Now, that may seem like not much, 2 to 3%, but every percentage point represents 1 million jobs times the length of the recovery. So if Obama had just practiced his, his putting or his jump shot and not gone into office the, the other day, we had a normal 3%. We'd have had 7 million more jobs than we had right now. I think this is a specifically LA question. What are the odds of Omar Navarro beating mad Maxine Waters? Is that a hot race down there or not really? <sighs> You know, years ago, a guy named Russ Moen ran against her. He was a Vietnam vet. And for the first and only time, I really campaigned hard for somebody. Didn't get compensated for it. Went to about seven or eight events in the inner city campaigning for this guy. I think Maxine Waters won 80% to 20%. Mm -hmm. um, Omar ran against her before. This is the second time running. He got creamed. 
Uh, I was hoping that because Maxine Waters has become President Trump's number one nemesis, that the money would come flowing in from all over the country. I've had Omar on my show several times. It hasn't happened. I think most people think she's unbeatable and therefore not getting behind him. Republican Party did not get behind him either. Mm. Speaking of the Republican Party, I'm often asked, have you ever thought about running for office? And the answer is, whenever I get that feeling, I lay down, wait for it to go away. <laughs> Um, but one time, some people with serious money approached me, I mean serious money, and said, if you uh, run and get the Republican nomination, if you run, we'll, we'll back you. And I said, well, if I get the Republican nomination, I will do it. So I flew, again, my own dime to Washington, D.C. I didn't want anybody making any argument that I was using money that I shouldn't be using, so I used my own money. Flew to Washington, D.C. and met all the people involved in the Senate uh, recruiting committee, including John Cornyn. And they said, well, tell me about your background. I told them about, you know, law school and, and, and college and my father and what he did and he's a Marine and this and I just knew I had him riveted and I just knew I was going to get the nomination. I fly back to LAX, phone rings, we're going with Carly Fiorina. <laughs> I said, why? They said, three reasons. One, she's a woman. I said, well, I'll give you that. <laughs> Number two, she has more money than you. I said, I'll give you that. Number three, she has higher name recognition than you do. I said, no, she doesn't. Not in California, she doesn't. Maybe in Washington, D.C. she does, but not in California. The reason I know that is because one of my buddies put my name on a poll. They're expensive to find out what my name recognition was in California. It was 35%. At the same juncture against uh, Barbara Boxer's first two opponents, uh, Bruce Hershenson and Matt Fong, they had 5% name recognition. So I'm seven times more popular than her opponents were before. And, and they still went with Fiorina, and she lost by 10 points. I could have lost by 10 points and spent less money. <laughs> Another question deals with um, a First Amendment, and the question is, do you consider, if you consider Google, Twitter, Facebook, closing of Alex Jones accounts, censorship, any thoughts on? No, it's not censorship, because these are private companies. Uh, it's crap. Uh, it's not fair. It's not right. Uh, but it's not censorship. Uh, if they choose not to run somebody's uh, stuff, uh, they, have, they have the power and the right to do that. The, the response is for us to have our own Google, have our own uh, Facebook, have our own Twitter. And why don't we? I mean, I'm in Silicon Valley. You're telling me you can't figure out some sort of way of having conservative platforms that can't be monkeyed with? Pardon the expression. Very good. You know I had to work that in. That was great. That was good. There was a bunch of questions of similar, similar theme, and I think the, the questioner, questionnaire asked, uh, was very good to go ahead. These look like they're typed up so obviously in advance, and they deal with the black experience with children, um, being a traitor to your race, uh, those w and I'm sure you've had some of those personal experiences. I'd like to comment just a, on that. Just a few. Yeah. Well, anybody in this room who's black, who's conservative, has heard all those things. You know that. Um, and th what they've done, they meaning the left, is they've created this idea that if you depart from the conventional point of view and you're black, you're a sellout, you're a traitor. They don't want black people to start thinking the way everybody else does about schools, about streets, about safety. Uh, and if black people are no longer believing that racism remains a major problem in America, then all of a sudden, what is the rationale behind voting for a Democrat? The Democrats have marketed themselves as wearing the white hat when it comes to race, and, Demo and Republicans wear the black hat, even though historically it is BS, as you well know. It was Democrats that opposed the 13th Amendment that freed, uh, that, that, um, the amendment that freed uh, blacks, and the 14th Amendment that made blacks citizens. Democrats opposed these unanimously. The 15th Amendment, on paper anyway, they gave blacks the right to vote. Democrats, uh, Democrats opposed it. You look at the Civil Rights Act of 1964. As a percentage of the party, more Republicans voted for it than did Democrats. In fact, it was uh, Al Gore's father who led one of the longest, I believe, believe it was at the time, the longest filibuster to prevent the bill from even coming on the floor. The NAACP gave an award to um, uh, Everett Dirksen, the senator from uh, Illinois, and uh, said that but for his leadership, the bill never would have gotten navigated uh, to its success. So, uh, and these programs that the, the that the Democrats push, like race-based preferences. Sounds wonderful on paper. 
You lower the standards to get somebody admitted to a school for racial diversity. You increase the possibility that this student is going to flunk out. Uh, the student flunks out, uh, angry at the world. Why did you put me here if I couldn't compete? They have debt, and now you've made things worse. Uh, that student would have been perfectly fine at double A ball. Instead, you put them in major leagues or triple A ball. You put them in major leagues where they flunk out. Uh, it's a uh, uh, a feel-good program that has horrible consequences. Minimum wage. Before the minimum wage really took effect, black teenager was the most likely to be employed in this country. Now they're one of the least likely to be employed in this country. Uh, Milton Friedman, one of my favorite economists, said that the minimum wage is perhaps the most anti-Negro law on the statute books, end of quote. And yet the Democrats still pull that lever for the party that wants to increase it to $15 an hour. I know what happened when you increase the minimum wage because my father used to work at a restaurant. And I know decisions that are deferred are, are not made, hiring decisions are not made because of the minimum wage. Uh, yet it's a staple of the Democratic Party. And again, blacks go in there and pull that lever like lemmings for a party that will not let you have choice in school, that won't do anything about uh, illegal immigration, and has left-wing programs like minimum wage that hurt jobs. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, we meet here once a month and uh, there's always a series of questions which are similar. In fact, I often I'll start my introductions with, welcome to the Liberty Forum where once a month we know that we are not alone. And one of the questions we all you get in, for all the speakers is, what can we do? Because you, you started out with, with Hollywood and, and the media and the academia. What, what can we do as conservatives? It's really easy. Get involved and stay involved. By get involved, I mean give money to, uh, to parties and to uh, people, candidates that you support. Uh, support websites. They all lose money, whether it's the Daily Caller, the Daily Wire, uh, Breitbart. Most of these websites don't make money. National Review doesn't make money. William F. Buckley used to have to uh, put out the tin cup every year to make it meet. So these publications do not make money. Uh, uh, Think tanks like the Cato Institute uh, could use money. Heritage Foundation could, could use money. Get involved. Support people. Campaign issues that you care about. And that's why we and are vote. here. Thanks and very vote. much. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank Larry. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.